right, everyone, let's get started. Uh, so uh, my name is Chad Zellinger. Um, I'm the vice president of CMEA and I'll be your uh, host uh, today. We wanna welcome you to our, let's see, our uh, Sip and Share webinar series. Uh, this is Making Sense of It All, Tech Tools for Meaningful Musical Experiences. Uh, we have a couple of uh, great guests uh, that are going to share uh, some thoughts with us today. Um, they are not from California, but we're gonna, we're gonna introduce them here in a couple of slides. Uh, first, we wanna go over uh, some of the information that we present here weekly. So if you haven't heard it, we'd like to share with you now. Next slide, please. All right, just wanted to let you know that we do uh, record these webinars and they are archived. Um, you can view them in a couple places. You can see them um, on our website, on our Sip and Share webinar page. Um, you can also uh, subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel where they're all stored there as well. So we wanna make sure that uh, all of our children under the age of 13 have adult permission before accessing any online resources and that students or families uh, do not provide any identifying information to gain access to those uh, resources, free or paid. Uh, so uh, CMEA, as a uh, state uh, member of NAFME, advocates equitable access for instruction. So as we curate ma uh, materials to help membership implementing online learning, we recognize some of these following ideas. So that universal access to learning devices and internet services, uh, professional learning opportunities, and time for educators to design these environments, tasks and assessments, uh, opportunities for students to learn how to succeed with online instruction, uh, coupled with an appropriate learning management system. Uh, resources, resources. Uh, so um, up at our parent organization at NAFME, you just go ahead and uh, click on the four teachers. Um, there's a lot of resources that are pertinent to teaching and learning. There's also resources to our COVID-19 situation that we're involved in. Also at our own website, so calmusiced.com. Uh, you can click on our COVID-19 information and resources. We have a bunch of articles there um, that talk about uh, everything from wrapping the year up uh, in this unprecedented times that we're living through, as well as some other articles that, that are really valuable during this time. I'm gonna hand it over to our president, Armelin De La O, and she's gonna go over the next few slides with you. All right, good afternoon and welcome. I'm excited that you're all here again on this uh, lovely Friday evening, getting ready for our beautiful weekend. So I um, just wanted to share a little bit about uh, what CME has been up to in terms of advocacy, some of the things that we are working on for you as our members. Um, so since just thinking about since March, uh, well, actually all the time, we meet every Tuesday morning. There's a team of us that uh, work and connect with our lobbyists um, and work on advocacy for music education um, in the state. And then um, some of the things that we've been up to since we've been in our um, sheltering in place. We recently composed a letter and sent it to our governor um, regarding equity of education funding, making sure that he understands and that we under, he knows that we understand that the, these are unprecedented times, but that we don't want to see music education treated or arts education treated any differently than any of the other subject areas that are taught in schools. That same letter was shared with our partner organizations, dance, theater, and visual arts, um, so that they could also uh, support that same thinking with our governor. We've recently composed a letter and um, are in the process of sending it um, a, a letter similar to that that we sent to go our governor, but a little bit different to talk more um, explicitly about the need to be equitable when we start to look at uh, changes that might be happening in our schools. So to our California school board members, to our county offices of education, to our um, California Administrators Association, and to also um, our state superintendent of public instruction, uh, Tony Thurman. Go ahead and change the slide. We also, as you may know, and hopefully um, are, are part of these campaigns, we have a social media president, present, resident, presence um, and cam campaigns that are show, supporting Roadmap to Recovery. Um, many of you may have seen that uh, pushed out last weekend um, regarding the input that the um, governor wanted in relationship to 
uh, how schools would reopen. So I just found out also today with that, that it is still open and available. So if you didn't get a chance to respond, you can still go on to that, um, the California Department of Edu, no, it's the C California governor. Yes, it's uh, the governor's website and link to that. So that link is also found on our website and maybe we'll send it out again just to keep a reminder that people can still give input. We've also joined the national campaign um, for action alerts for our HEROES Act supporting the 200 billion for education funding. So we wanna be part of that grassroots campaign. Um, we continue to write letters uh, in support of AB 1850, which is the cleanup bill to AB 5. For those of you who are in California, that is the, the bill dealing with um, independent consultants. For those of you who are outside of California, um, well, you couldn't come into California. No, just kidding. Um, they, but the idea is to help them understand the importance of adjudication and all the things that we do for students um, and how important that is to maintain that as independent consultants um, for our students. Uh, our executive board, um, we've sent our resumes to be part of the uh, loss of learning task force and our reopening of schools task force. So we've been um, working on and hoping to get on some of those, those state task force to improve um, and have input into what's going on in our schools. We have created a virtual solo festival that is now underway, right? Um, we're starting the adjudication process and we had over 300 entries. So that's an exciting thing. And uh, as you know, we've been holding these weekly Friday Sip and Shares and we are glad that you're here with us. So there are many things and ways that you can connect with us, Facebook, um, our website, Twitter, Instagram, um, all of these things, and we're excited. You can click on that QR code and, and find us all over. So we're excited to be uh, with you today, and uh, thank you to Stephen and Teresa for being and sharing with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Armelin. Appreciate that. Um, just wanted to let you know that we also have our CMEA president-elect with us here today, Ann Fennell. Uh, and we also have our executive administrator and extraordinaire behind the scenes, Trish Adams is also with us. So uh, without further ado, and I'm gonna just check my tiles here real quick, uh, make sure I'm not leaving anyone out. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> without further ado, let's, let's meet our presenters today. All right, I'm happy to introduce to you, uh, Teresa Hoover uh, Dukasu. She is a band director uh, from Arlington, Virginia, uh, with a bachelor's degree from Penn State University and a master's in wind conducting from Westchester in Pennsylvania. Currently, she teaches sixth through eighth grade band and seventh and eighth grade guitar. She is a Google certified trainer and a Google certified innovator. And I'll be looking forward to hearing what that is all about. Um, you can find her on Twitter at, at Musical Teresa. Next. Uh, Mr. Stephen Keyes joins us from Kentucky. Uh, he is a band director at uh, Bondurant Middle School in Frankfurt. He has a bachelor's in music from University of Kentucky in Lexington and a master of arts from George Mason University from Fairfax, Virginia. Currently teaches sixth, seventh and eighth grade band, eighth grade jazz band, seventh and eighth grade general music, music technology classes. Mr. Keyes is also a, a Google certified educator and trainer. He, he can be found on Twitter at the Stephen Keyes. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over uh, to our presenters. And Teresa, if you go ahead, there we go. Um, I found this meme morning as I was going through Facebook and I was like, this is perfect. And um, I hate to put this up there since I'm presenting and Teresa's presenting, but I know that we've all been through so much over the last eight, nine weeks, and that it can be taxing on us. And uh, as I was talking uh, to Teresa earlier this week, we we're really hoping that as we go through this, it's just not us doing this to you or for you, but that with questions that come in and things like that, that you just go ahead and ask them. Um, we would really like for this to be more interactive um, it's, it's more fun that way. And then before Teresa starts with her first tech tools, uh, just a few things to think about. I'm always asked 
about technology in my band room, the following questions. Why do it? When do it? Where do it? And how to do it? And um, as you're doing anything uh, with technology, uh, always say keep first things first. Kids joined band, choir, and orchestra and other classes to make music and to learn to play an instrument. They didn't do it to get on Chromebooks and go through all this. So the technology should be there to kind of enhance the experience they're always having. Music should always be at the fore. And then when it comes to technology, make it fit your curriculum. When you do technology should be a natural progression as you move forward. Uh, don't just throw it in there because if you just throw it in there and it's very random and it doesn't make sense, the kids will figure it out and uh, they'll move forward. So no matter what I say or what Teresa says, remember, it's still about music. It's still about kids making music. We're just trying to find uh, some ways to uh, interject some technology up in there. So Teresa, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you. Well, before we get into our first official tech tool, I'm going to see, uh, Chad, can you place that link into the chat? Absolutely. As Stephen said, we really do want this to be um, an interactive experience. We, we don't want for us to be the only ones doing and talking and sharing and learning. Um, we think that everybody here has something to offer. So we are going to actually introduce our first tool, which is a Jamboard. Um, so in the chat, you should see a link to the Jamboard. And what we're gonna ask you to do is right now, follow that link. Um, if you haven't ever experienced Jamboard before, a Jamboard is basically an interactive whiteboard that is meant for collaboration. It's meant for people to work together to add to it, and it's, it's a really great tool that Google offers. Um, so we have set this Jamboard up somewhat as a handout to you, but also a way for us to collect resources, collect ideas, so that something that we can all all experience together and learn from. So um, yours should look similar to mine. Up at the top, you'll be able to flip through the different frames. The first frame's an introduction. On the second page, we would love for you go to go ahead and introduce yourself. So you're gonna grab a sticky note. The sticky notes are over on the left-hand side. Um, just click on a sticky note. It's gonna pop it up there on the screen. You can type in your name, where you're from, what you, what you teach. And you'll notice there's a slide for each thing that we're going to talk about today. So as we go through this webinar and as we're talking about the different tools, start putting up ideas that you have. Um, how do you think you could use that tool in your classroom? How is it going to enhance the musical experiences of your students? So um, please, like I said, please feel free to, to add things, to join in and just experience this with all of us. Um, and as you're doing that, I'm going to start talking about my first tool. So uh, the Chrome Music Lab is another, it's another thing put out by Google, and it's one of what they call the Google experiments. Um, it's not part of the, the core G Suite tools, but it, it's something just fun. And the Chrome Music Lab is perfect to get our kids exploring and creating music. Um, a couple of my favorite tools within this Chrome Music Lab are the Song Maker. The song maker is, is what it sounds like. It enables you to um, create songs, which, you know, how can you go wrong? And as I'm saying this, I'm wondering, did I remember to share my system audio? So we're going to find out in a second. Uh, to create the songs, basically, you're just clicking and adding little notes. And any chance you can hear that, Chad? <laughs> I'm getting a big no. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, so I that means I, I did not share my system audio. Um, when we do the switch, I will, I'll make sure to, to share. As you put the, um, sorry, as you click on the different boxes, it's essentially going to be creating a melody for you. And I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to quick stop share. You're going to have to see my face for a second. And see, even us tech people, we this will give us time stuff. to fill out the Jamboard. Actually. Hey, there you we, go. And everyone's kind of like seeing where everyone's from. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Sorry. I'm too focused on my Chrome Music Lab. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that people are in the Jamboard. That's good. It really is yes. a fun tool. And don't, don't feel like you can mess anything up either. Just, just go for it. All right. So anyways, as I was saying, you, you can go ahead and put in insert melodies right into this, this song maker. Um, both melodies, there's also a spot where you can put in percussion parts and it's going to play it for you. And 
I'm hoping that you guys actually heard that. So I've been using the Chrome Mus Music Lab, the song maker this week. Um, and I, one of the challenges I gave my students was to try to put in a melody that they recognize and to add a percussion part to it. So a lot of them did some pretty simple things. We had some like hot cross buns. One of them did this uh, little rock point five tune that we had been playing in beginning band. Um, and then I got this one. <laughs> I don't even know how he did that. <laughs> this kid put in this whole entire tune. He, he had all the piano parts, all the percussion parts, and it was awesome. So the, um, the song maker is a great way for students to be, to be creating melodies. I think this is something that we can really think about now. You know, when the kids are at home, they're not with us in the classroom. We can still have them creating music. Yes, I'm sure it's okay. We don't save my song. The nice thing about the song maker is you can save um, your save your creation and then it can be shared by link. So that's how I had the kids turning in that assignment. Um, another fun one is just the rhythm creator. It's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's going to, it's going to give you a, a rhythm loop that you can build and, and adapt to a bunch of different ways. <laughs> They have a couple different ones with different instruments and different meters just to make it interesting. Sometimes I'll put this on even when I'm in the band room and we'll, we'll keep this looping during warm-ups, whether we're doing rhythmic things, long tones, just to keep it interesting. I'll invite kids up to the front of the room and say, okay, who wants to, who wants to create the rhythm today? Um, and, and we'll go from there. And right now, again, kids can be doing this at home too. Have a rhythm, do some improv over it, do something to just to make it interesting. Um, there's a whole bunch of different experiments in here. The other one that I enjoy is Kandinsky. I, I haven't thought of a really, I, I don't know how to say it. There's not a, a super educational reason to use this other than it's just really fun. <laughs> and sometimes music just needs to be fun. Um, you're going to be putting lines and shapes that will create sound. And when you play it, and it's just a fun way to visualize music and to have kids be artistic. Sometimes you can tell them to draw a picture and see what it'll sound like or write their names and, and they can have a lot of fun. So again, this is the Chrome Music Lab. It's just a great way for kids to experiment with and to, uh, to have fun creating music. So we're gonna transition now to Steven. He's gonna talk about his tool. And as we're making the transition happen with the screen shares, go ahead into the Jamboard and put some ideas as how you think you might be able to use the Chrome Music Lab, either right now when distance learning or when you are back in person with your students. Go for it, Steven. Awesome, I think it's much. Let me see if I can get my screen to share here. Um, For, for my part, I'm going to talk about um, three add-ons and extensions that you can use with Google Chrome. Um, two of them are not music specific. One of them is, and it's the uh, add-on in Google Docs and Slides from flat.io, Screencastify, and a new one that just came out uh, called Moat. Um, to get an add-on, it's very simple. Here's a, I'm hoping you can see this document here, but it says add-ons and then you just go down here and hit get add-ons and it takes you to um, where you can search the different ones that are there. And so when you're there, you just type in flat and you have to, there we go. Um, maybe, here we go, sorry. Uh, I hit flat. And there it is. And then it's already installed on mine, so I don't need to get it. But you just click it and you install it. And then it and all your add-ons will be up here. Now, add-ons and extensions are just third-party things that aren't official Google, but they work with uh, Google. And so um, the really good thing I like about Google is they, they listen to feedback. And so there are many times that some of these third-party add-ons and extensions have been picked up and become a natural part of it. But what Flat does is it lets you put a musical snippet. And when they say snippet, they're talking just a few measures, maybe six at the most. And you can pick any kinds of different stabs here. I use this for rhythms of the week. 
I can put rhythms on the board, I can project them out. And that way, if the second class comes in and we're doing the same rhythms, I don't have to erase it. Uh, I have all of my students add this to their Chromebooks, but then you just click on it and you have a music and it hits fully functioning, notes, articulations, ornaments, then you can just click where you want it. And I'm just randomly making a masterpiece. And then when you're done, you do have some options, and I know I don't have the volume on, but you can listen back to it so the kids can hear what they've written. You can hear it beforehand. And then when you've got it figured out, you just hit insert. And what it does is it creates a graphics file of what you just wrote. And so you can do all kinds of things with it. You can stretch it out. You can make it bigger. Um, I use, like I say, I use this for uh, rhythm of the week. Um, whenever we do scale theory and we're talking about intervals, uh, I can put a C major scale up and we can talk about whole steps and half steps and how they relate uh, on the board. Um, but flat, I think this is an essential add-on that I think every music educator should have. Every band, every choir kid uh, can should add this to their Chromebooks. Now, add-ons and extensions, you may need to talk to your IT people because sometimes some of them, of them are blocked. Um, I know at our school, we have a set list of things that have been approved. And if I come across something, all I got to do is tell them, they look at it and, and they add it in there. But um, I just think it's an essential tool. Now you don't get the playback feature when you put it in your doc and that's because of copyright. Uh, Google's really big into copyright and I uh, want to uh, thank them for that. Um, it just, it's another way for um, us to kind of teach kids as we move forward. Um, the rights and wrongs about music. Uh, the other one that I want to talk about real quick is called, it's an extension. And to get your extensions, you go to chrome.google.com. Let me see if I have uh, the page saved up here. I don't, I'm not sure if I do or not. Nope, that's a different one. But you go to chrome.google.com and you'll have a list of extensions. And then this one is called Moat. And what I found myself doing during um, all this crisis learning time, providing feedback to the kids and typing feedback in Google Docs or Google Classroom. And I just found it, I'm not the best typer in the world and it was slow and it was tedious and it was taking a lot of time. But here I have Hello Chasmic and then I can come over here and I wanna add a comment to this doc, the moat extension is right here. All I have to do is click it and I can now speak my uh, feedback into the computer. And when I'm done talking, I hit it again and then it appears in there. And so now let's see if it can figure out, I'm not sure if it picked up my or not, but I, the kids have a link that they can click on and hear feedback. And another really good feature about it is it can also transcribe. So maybe you got some kids have a hard time reading they have or they have the transcription there and plus it gives you another um, record uh, of you interacting with the kids but I really like moat it saved me a lot of time um, by just being able to to speak it instead of type it and then the last extension I know I'm going really quick here and I hope uh, hope you're catching all this stuff fairly hey, quickly hey Steven Yes. Uh, can I just give a plug in for that on Google Classroom? Go nice nice extension, by the way. So, so you can leave comments on Google Classroom assignments with Moat. Yes. You can just speak them in. Yes. So, so the, the students, not only do they have the written comments, but you can speak comments into, right into Google Classroom. So this mm -hmm. add-on extension works inside Google Classroom too. And it's, I mean, it's, for me, it's just such a time saver because uh, I'm not the quickest typer. I had typing class when I was in high school and I wish I'd have paid attention. Um, I really do. Uh, I didn't. I'm really good with these. Um, and the last one real quick is Screencastify. And Screencastify, once you add it in, if you can see my screen where my little pointer is up here, you'll have a little icon that appears like this. And what it lets you do is it lets you capture your whole screen. It lets you capture your browser uh, window or a certain tab. And you can record yourself uh, you can record presentations and put them up. I use this for my weekly instructions for the kids. When I put the assignments in Google Classroom, the first thing I would have in there is a video of me explaining the assignments. Um, I tried at first typing 
um, notes in Google Classroom, kids aren't reading the notes, but they might watch. I found that they will watch the videos uh, more. And so Screencastify is really, it's, it's a free extension. You can record just your webcam only. You can do the browser tab with the kind of like a zoom with your little picture in the bottom of it. Uh, kids can record their playing test for me and send them in um, through Screencastify. But what I really like about all three of these add-ons and extension is that they're free. And I know um, anytime we can come across things that are free, uh, it, it, it's a lot um, better on that. But these three are things that I use. I use Flat and Screencastify constantly. My kids have them on their uh, Chromebooks. They don't have Moat because that came out after the pandemic hit. So I haven't seen my kids in person, but I have a feeling next year I will have them add that to theirs as well because um, they like, um, they would rather talk than type anyway. They're middle school kids and that's what they do. They're really good at talking. Um, so those are my three and I'm gonna try to find my Zoom here and I'm gonna stop sharing and send it back over to Teresa. So of course, we just want to keep redirecting you back around to the Jamboard. Please share, like, like some of you maybe already use this. What's great about Jamboard is it exists long after our session's done. So it's a resource that keeps on uh, resourcing. Uh, so. Hey Chad, can I, can I jump in real quick, Chad? Yes, please. I noticed on the uh, chat room, somebody asked, how do you get add-ons? And if you click, uh, you have to add add-ons to Google Docs or Google Slides specifically. Uh, like for example, flat, I have flat in Google Doc or my slide here, but I had to add it for that. But across the top ribbon, it says add-ons. Then you come down here to where it says get add-ons and that's how, you, um, that's how you get those. And then you can just search through all the different ones that you got in there. Sorry, I'm done now. Thank you, Steven. You're welcome. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to go share my screen, but yes, please make sure that you're putting ideas in the, in the Jamboard because I, I know we all have some really great things we can share. All right. Moving on to my next tool. This is the um, Google Arts and Culture, um, another awesome free resource by Google that is it's growing daily. Um, almost every time I go into this website, I find something new. And my first warning to you is it is a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> the, the I kept going in to like prepare for this presentation and I would find myself 45 minutes later, like <laughs> just down the rabbit hole. So make sure you allow yourself some time to explore, but it is, it's amazing. So uh, the first place that we're looking within Google Arts and Culture is the Performing Arts Center. Um, and as you can see across the top, there are resources for music, opera, theater, dance, and performance art. Um, and when I say resources, like it, it's, <laughs> there's some legitimate stuff in here. Um, one of my favorite things is the 360 videos. Um, there are, I think there's about four of them within this section of the website where you are, you're on stage. Um, I'm gonna attempt to show you that there's gonna be some, some latency issues, but they truly put you on stage with the performers. Welcome to New York City, home to the world famous Carnegie Hall. So they're talking a little bit about the, the venue and then they transitions into the actual music. Um, we have four different cameras you can choose from. You can also, just scroll around and watch. So there's the timpani player tuning <laughs> and the horn players. So uh, again, I'm not gonna jump ch jump cameras just because the it's not gonna go very smoothly for us, but you can be right there. Now, of course I picked this one because it's the Philadelphia Orchestra in Carnegie Hall and I'm a, Philadelphia is my home. So this one <laughs> always has meaning for me, but it's just such a neat experience. So um, it's, a, it's a chance for your kids to really just to get to explore some music. So not only are there 360 things, but there's a lot of different exhibits and collections within the Google Arts and Culture and with this, within this Performing Arts Center. So if you think about, I, I had a couple colleagues who um, 
usually every time or every year around this time, they take their kids to the Kennedy Center. We're in Washington, D.C., the Kennedy Center's right across the river. Um, but obviously that trip got canceled this year. So they were able to create, using this Kennedy Center exhibit, they were able to create a virtual field trip for the kids where they could go and explore the Kennedy Center with the students. Um, when you go into this particular exhibit, you see up where it says Kennedy Center, there's our little street view guy, the little yellow man. Uh, that means that we can actually go in and we can take a tour of the Kennedy Center and you can get this tour and see all of the various things that are inside of the Kennedy Center. Um, besides the, uh, the tour, there's different stories and the stories are online exhibits. You're going to get different things from each story. Uh, the one that talks about the historical truly talks about how the Kennedy Center came to be. You can see blueprints, you can see pictures of, um, of everyone as they were planning and building it. So each exhibit's going to be different. Another one of my favorites in this particular collection is the African American Dance. That collection is has 13 different videos showcasing African American African American dance at the Kennedy Center. And these are all curated right here for you and your students to watch for free. Um, so depending on what you were doing in class, if you if you wanted to somehow supplement what you're doing with this experience, it's it's really, really awesome. And as I said, it's all available on here for free. So you could share this with your students right now and they could go explore it. You know that because of that rabbit hole, they're going to be here for a while. Um, a couple other things you'll find in the Google Arts and Culture. Um, they have a daily, they call it Relax, Slow Down and Explore, a collection of music and art, where every day they have a different uh, museum that you can tour and it's set to classical music. Um, this, and like I said, it changes daily. So today there's ones that have to do with Natural Science Museum, uh, the screen painting in an art museum. I'm not sure if it will play for us. Just a way to make those connections between music and art. Um, and the final thing that I will share with you within this resource, if I can get my screen there. Um, you can make favorites and you can set, uh, set favorites, which is really helpful as you're going through and you're finding things that you like, you can favorite them. There's a little heart icon, to, uh, icon and it's going to be saved in your favorites tab from the um, Google Arts and Culture, uh, which is really helpful when, as you're finding things and you want to you know, keep in mind what to share with your students. Um, you can find those favorites. Another favorite that I have is this Giants of Jazz exhibit. This exhibit's neat because it's not only uh, art and music, but there's also a lot of historical information in there. So as you scroll through the exhibit, you can see pictures. They'll give you, you know, as I said, they give you some, some historical information. Louis Armstrong. And then there are, in addition, if I can get to it, <laughs> there are also some videos so you can actually be listening to the music. So it's just a great way for your students to explore um, some different musical elements, even if they can't actually go to those places. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing. You're going to jump back over to the Jamboard, put some ideas in, and then I'll turn it over to Stephen. And, and thank you, Teresa. <laughs> I love, I, I, there's in the chat, um, we're kind of watching some exciting, like, <laughs> wow, this is, and I, and I echo Steven's comment. I, yeah, I, love if I can come to one of these and I take away stuff. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I sort of kind of love that lifelong learning piece. Um, so I, what I wanted to say, uh, it's not about me. Um, <laughs> we've used, we've used the chat box, uh, as a way to ask questions too. Feel free to keep using the chat box if you'd like questions feel free to hop over to the Jamboard. Um, so just so you know that I'm still kind of kind of monitoring that and I'll hop in and out. Um, Teresa and Steven and I work, work kind of well together. So if you have any questions or wanted to know anything more, I'm sure there's some time built into this that we can, um, maybe we just talk and have a conversation. So yeah. please feel free to use the chat while uh, we're getting ready for the next, uh, the next chapter. <laughs> My chapter, um, you know, and since we all, since we can't really travel anywhere, uh, I mean, I've rescheduled my vacations three times now that Google Arts and Cultures is a great way to kind of at least 
see something new, see something different than the living room. I'm gonna share my screen real quick and we're gonna jump into my next tools. And for me, I'm gonna talk about, I can't find my, the little toolbox is in the way up here. Here we go, sip and share. Um, I'm gonna talk about two tools, once again, not music specific, but I think that's one of the things that um, we're learning during this time is sometimes we have to take tools that aren't built for music and find ways to, to use them to our advantage. Because um, let's be honest, there are more things out there uh, that are available, not music specific than our music specific, although everybody is getting so much um, better with this. And these next two tools I'm gonna talk about uh, are one is called ReadWorks and one is called Edpuzzle. Um, I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but I know in Kentucky, they have all these reading initiatives. And the good news is I have convinced my school that all reading is, is making sense of symbols on paper. And I have convinced them that music is reading because that's what we're doing in music class. We're looking at black dots on white paper and we're making sense of it. And so I don't have to do an enormous amount of those things that other teachers have to do because kids are reading every day in my room. They're just reading music. But every now and then, I need a quick assignment to assess my kids on something, or maybe um, a substitute day. I have an emergency substitute and I've gotta be gone and I need to put something up for the kids to do. This is where these two things um, come in handy. ReadWorks is a site, readworks.org, that is free. You just gotta sign up for it, but it has articles over every subject and you can come down here and hopefully you can see my screen, but you can pick grade level. Then you can come down here and pick different topics and different Lexile levels. Uh, and you're able to go through it and just really kind of customize it. One of the things I like about ReadWorks is many of their articles come with question sets. And so after the kids read the article, they answer the questions that are involved. And here's the magical part of it. ReadWorks grades it for you. So all you have to do then is go look at the printout and you can see what, how the kids did on the assignment. Um, on this one here, I just typed in New York Philharmonic because one of the things I found this year is that there are program notes from the New York Philharmonic on here. Here is the program notes from Porgy and Bess, the Cuban Overture. Um, down here as I scroll down, here's American in Paris. And so one of the assignments that my kids did during the uh, lockdown and the school shutdown is I put the program notes to American in Paris in Google Classroom and I asked the kids to read those program notes. Then I asked them to go to YouTube, find a recording of an American in Paris and listen to it. And then in a Google Doc, I had them just respond what they thought about the piece. Did the program notes do enhance what the piece was that they heard. And so there's all kinds of ways to pull this in. Now there are no questions with the program notes. They're just the program notes. But once again, I was able to kind of what we call app smash, where we used um, ReadWorks, YouTube, and a Google Doc, and the kids were able to go in and send me responses. There, there are articles on here over everything. Um, I'd like I say, I just typed in um, the New York Philharmonic and that's what came up. But there are articles on jazz history, New Orleans. Um, there's one on John Philip Sousa. And so the kids are able to read the articles and answer the questions and submit it. And all of it goes through Google Classroom. And for those of you who don't use Google Classroom, maybe you have another LMS. It syncs up um, with, those, with those two. Um, but it's just a great way to just push it out there. And immediately the kids have it. I know I had... Uh, one emergency, I had more than one emergency day this year, um, but where I had to put an assignment up and I would just needed something. And I'm not fortunate enough to have uh, music subs. And so when I get a sub, it's someone who has no clue about what happens in the band room and uh, they can't do band. And so I try to make my assignments as relevant as possible. The kids are listening to music. 
they're responding to music. And so I'm trying to at least give them something relevant than just a bunch of uh, a mindless, mindless worksheets that they're not going to do anyway. The second tool is Edpuzzle. And what Edpuzzle does is it allows you to take video clips and add questions and comments to it. Um, I have one here that I just threw together uh, called Form in Music, and I'm not gonna play the video for you. But down here, there are different questions that I've asked. So the kids watch the video. When it reaches a certain point, the video stops, and the kids have to type in the answers. And then they hit enter, and then it goes on. Now, good news, they can't just skip to the questions and answer them. Ed Puzzle makes them watch the whole video. Um, and so you can come in and uh, do different videos for it. I know a great thing, and I got this from Teresa the other day, she doesn't know it, um, but you can record your concerts and put your concerts in Ed Puzzle and have the kids respond to their playing. You can use Ed Puzzle's videos. They come from uh, YouTube, Khan Academy, TED Talks, but you can also upload your own. Uh, you can even make your own video in Screencastify and put that video up there. But it's another way of getting the kids to respond to things. Um, I really try to preach comprehensive musicianship in my classrooms. Um, I want my kids to play their horns great and I want them to be awesome, but I want them to understand it. And so by using the tools ReadWorks and Edpuzzle, I'm getting feedback from them. They're letting me know if they understand it. And a couple of times you may have to walk the kids through it and listen to um, An American in Paris with them and talk about it or go through a video and talk about uh, your concerts just so they understand it. But those two tools are wonderful tools that, and they're free. They're free. Once again, you have to sign up to be in ReadWorks, but it doesn't cost anything. You just sign up. I just signed up through Google, and I think the same thing through Edpuzzle. It's been a while since I signed up for Edpuzzle because I've been using it now for a couple of years. But those two tools are just uh, really good tools to get kids to to respond to you. And so I am going to stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Teresa. I have. I have. Thank you, Stephen. I uh, uh, Edpuzzle. I had to sign up a a domain through Edpuzzle maybe like three or four weeks ago. Right now, Edpuzzle, they're, they're like pushing the pro platform to any edu account, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and not only that, if you sign up on behalf of teachers in your, ed, in your edu account, they push it to the whole domain. <laughs> I don't know if that's, if that's of interest to anyone. So let's say Holly signs up for Edpuzzle through her ed, uh, educational account, Edpuzzle is just pushing it to every teacher with that domain. So just, just food for thought. I know there's another question that popped here, Chad, that I want to answer real quick. Then I'll turn over to Teresa. Sweet. But the question was, do the kids have, do the kids have also have to Edpuzzle? I can't, I can't read. Do the kids respond in Edpuzzle? Yes, they do. Um, you can ask the kids if, say, you're doing your own concert performance, you could stop it at a certain point and say, okay, in the next section, listen for balance and blend, listen for articulation, and then play the next section and go, okay, tell me what you thought about how did we do on balance and blend and articulation. So, yeah, the kids are, the kids are able to respond. It's not just questions. It can be um, open response things that they put in there. Sorry. Done? Even, sorry, I'm going to ask a question, too. Do the go. kids have to have accounts, or can they just... Uh... Do they just, how do they, how are they going to access this? I put the links in Google Classroom and they just click on the link and it shows up. Now, um, I'm trying to think, because it's been a while since I've had kids sign up, because I, I usually spend the first week of school, the first few days of school with the kids, getting them signed up for everything. Uh, and I can't remember off the top of my head right now um, if the kids have to log in with Google, but they all have their, all of, we're a Google school, we're a one-to-one -one with Chromebooks. Um, but I think that it just shows up in their, in their Google stream and they click on the link and it comes up for them. I think it's been a while. <laughs> awesome. All right. So I'm going to share my screen again and go on to uh, the last tool that I'm going to share today. 
which is Flipgrid. Now, I would imagine some of you probably have used Flipgrid before and Flip, Flipgrid, it's, it might be one of my favorites next to the Google things. Okay, I need that little dialog box to go away. All right, so Flipgrid's a video response platform where you as the teacher are going to create a question or a prompt of some sort and the kids are going to respond to it by video. Um, so I'll show you a sample one right now. This is one um, I actually used last summer with a, with a class of teachers that I was teaching this to. Um, and the, they were talking just about integrating tech and the kids saw my prompt, you know, welcome, use this space to experiment with Flipgrid. And when I say kids, I mean the um, grown teachers in the course, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and this was a spot where I asked them to make an introduction video. So to do that, all they had to do was come down here. They clicked on the green plus sign and they were able to create that introduction video. And what happened to their video is it then shows up in this grid for everyone to see. So that's what's a little bit different about Flipgrid in comparison to say having your kids submit a video in Google Classroom or submit it like uh, my school uses Canvas, submit, they submit Canvas. Only I see it, only the teacher sees those videos. But in Flipgrid, it comes into this grid so everybody can see. And you're not doing that in a way to say, oh, everybody has to, has to see what you're doing and you have to perform well enough for everybody. It's more the idea that you're, you're building that social aspect. We're building that community that especially right now when the kids don't get to see each other face to face, they can have that opportunity to interact and to share. So Flipgrid's really awesome for that. Um, I've been using it during this time. I've been using it for a lot of just fun things. Um, one week we did a Wacky Wednesday where I told the kids they just needed to make a bizarre Flipgrid video with their instrument. It needed to be something wacky. So I had some kids wearing costumes. I had some kids um, playing their music backwards. Um, kids were just like, there was dogs in videos. There were, it was just all kinds of crazy stuff, but they were playing their instruments and they were having fun and they, they were enjoying it. Um, another week we did a Name That Tune where they they had to play something but not tell us what it was and then they had they all took turns guessing you know what people played um, we've had theme weeks we've had John Williams weeks where they have to play John Williams music again it's just that time for kids to to experiment and to to get to see each other they they miss each other I mean I miss them I know that <laughs> I know that they all miss each other too um, but one of the other things that I've really enjoyed about Flipgrid during this time is actually what's called their shorts feature. So my school is very unique in that we completely block YouTube, 100% blocked, not allowed. Um, we are a Canvas, we, we use Canvas and we use Google, um, but it's, it's challenging to create something that both parents can access and students can access. If I made a video and I put it on YouTube for the parents to see, that would be great, but then the kids can't see it. So if I put the video in Canvas, the kids can see it, but then the parents can't see it. And there was this big disconnect of how I could share things um, with both the, the families and with the students. And then I've discovered the shorts camera within Flipgrid. And essentially the shorts camera is, it's, it's a camera. It's, it's a video recording tool, but when it records the video, it saves it to the Flipgrid platform and gives you a link that you can then share with anybody in the world. They don't have to go to YouTube. They don't have to log into Canvas. They don't need to go into any other thing. They simply click on the link and they follow that link into to watch your video. Um, so for me, it's been just like a game changer. Steven was talking about how he makes the videos to you know, explain instructions. I've, I've been making videos just to say, okay, here's what we're doing this week. This is what's going on. But I can share the video with my students and with the parents with just one click. So to access the shorts, you do need to have your, a teacher account for Flipgrid. Flipgrid, like a lot of the stuff Steven was saying, is completely free, like 100% free. You sign up for your teacher account, um, and you just follow the shorts menu at the top of the page. Um, you'll click on record a new short and it's gonna bring up the camera. Um, with, within the, the Flipgrid shorts camera, you can just record as you would like this. There's also the option to do a screen recording, which has been a, also a game changer. I can really easily make a screen recording to share with my students. Um, you can also just add a video clip. So if you had taken a video on your phone or your iPad, you can import that video directly into Shorts, or you could even um, record a video without, without any audio at all. So it's just an easy, easy way 
um, after you've finished making your video. Oh, I'm sorry, before I get to that, the other feature that's great and that my kids have really been enjoying um, is there's a whiteboard feature where you can also have a whiteboard. Um, I did a, a Flipgrid this past week where the students were reading an article about something about, uh, I don't even remember now, wow. You can tell it's been a long week. <laughs> the kids had, were reading an article about something musical and I asked them to respond to it in Flipgrid. And some kids just made a video talking about it, but other kids, believe it or not, some of the shy middle school kids, those do exist, um, they didn't want to have their face on the video, so they put the whiteboard on and instead they just typed their response. So they could have a typed response and then that was their video. So it gives your kids who are just a little bit shy or, I mean, I don't, they're not shy. I watch them make TikTok videos. Like I know these kids aren't shy, but <laughs> it just gives them a different way to, to, uh, to interact. After you make the shorts video, uh, simply go into the video. There's gonna give you a link. It's gonna give you a QR code plus a bunch of different ways to post it directly to to certain places. Um, so while this is another tool that was not originally intended for, for music, it's, it's awesome for us, um, both to have the kids working together, interacting, seeing each other, and for what I can create for those students. So, Stephen, it is your turn. Flipgrid is awesome. Um... <laughs> I keep I looking at the chat board over here and I'm thinking we might want to do just a whole session just on Flipgrid because um, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's a tool that I can't live without and my kids um, have uh, really, uh, I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for with Flipgrid. I know that. All oh, right, yeah. for my last tool, yeah, for my last tool, I'm going to jump, I guess I need to share my screen first. Um, I love technology. Share screen. Um, and don't be afraid when you're messing with technology to make mistakes in front of your kids. It lets them know that you're human. It lets them know uh, that you go through struggles too. And plus every now and then you might have a kid show up who can fix that problem real quick and it makes them feel good about themselves. So I don't ever, I don't ever I love making mistakes in front of kids. It's just a, a great way to do it. Uh, now, note flight. NoteFlight is an online music notation program. Um, I like NoteFlight because it is so easy to use. Um, it's inexpensive. It does cost. We are now at the point where it does cost. But uh, compared to other notation programs, um, it might as well be close to being free. I, I, all of my kids have a subscription and it costs me $2.00 a kid and they have a full-blown music notation program um, at their uh, beck and call whenever they whenever they want to use it um, so that's one of the first things I do at the beginning of the year is I get my subscriptions to note flight and I get it out there uh, if you're worried about it we all do fundraisers and I always tell everybody in my presentations um, sell one extra candy bar and they have a subscription to uh, to note flight um, Note Flight is wonderful. It's web-based, and because it's web-based, it's available. You can just go back and forth. Where some programs, they have to be installed on your computer, and it can only be used on that computer. Note Flight is uh, a wonderful tool. But what I want to talk about Note Flight, and Note Flight integrates. And if you look up here in the upper uh, left-hand corner, it says there's the um, Google Classroom icon and then bond it it integrates right with uh, google classroom and i'm able to pull up exercises write in exercises and just push them out to the kids and note flight is so easy to learn that my kids have figured out all the tips and tricks and all the different ways to manipulate it but the thing that i like are the libraries now the note flight learn library is included it is free. It is part of the subscription. But as you have these other libraries down here, they do cost a little bit more um, to add. For me, it's just not cost effective. So I don't have subscriptions to those libraries. But the Note Flight Learn Library, I use it like it's going out of style. Um, I've got to hide this over here. But on the right hand side, it's got sight reading exercises, scale exercises, theory, melody, I mean, different things that you can come in. I'm just going to do the one I always do at every one of them, sight reading, and you can pick different keys that it's in, and I'm going to click it. Hopefully you're seeing this screen. Um, 
it comes up and once I decide that this is the one I want to do, I come and check a copy out. And I like no flight because it makes me check a copy out so I don't mess up my original. Too many times in my life, I've messed up the original copy of something and had to go back and fix it. But everything on the page is editable. And so I can come in and I can change the name of it. I can put my instructions um, here. And then when I'm finished, I can come up here to score details and I can send it out as a Google Classroom assignment. All I have to do is hit that, I can select which class gets it, and then it give it a title, I can put a brief description here, and then send it out to Google Classroom, and the kids automatically um, have this song to work on. Now, some people always look at this and they go, but what about my trombone players? They don't read in Treble Cliff. I used to think it took forever it would be hard for the kids to learn it, um, but I, it took me 10 minutes in class one day, and I sent an assignment out, this exact one, and I said, okay, now make it look like your instrument. And I had them go through the steps with me, and my kids know to turn off concert pitch. The pitchfork is highlighted. They know to click the pitchfork. They know to click the guitar, and that opens up a side menu, and it lets me know what it's written for. They then know to hit the pencil, it opens up a menu of all the different instruments and then my trombone players need it. So I'm going to hit trombone and I'm going to hit okay. And it automatically transposes it to bass clef. Now I know your trombone players aren't that good. Mine aren't either. With it highlighted in red, I just hit the command down arrow, down arrow, and it changes it. And now my kids have um, it, in the right key, it's in the right clef, it's in the right range. Um, if you have a kid that wants to work on their high range, well, command all and then up arrow and they can work on their high notes. Um, and so you're able to, instead of having to send something out to every kid and um, go through it that way, um, I'm able to do something one time, send it out to my class and they manipulate it. So throughout the shutdown, I will send them exercises and I say, okay, here's the instructions. Remember, pitchfork, guitar, pencil, they know those things. And then they're able to um, go through and uh, manipulate it, play it and record it. Now, they, my kids would have this exercise recorded in Flipgrid. You can also, record right into note flight by hitting this button and play along with it. And then I can go in and uh, do it. But there is so much that you can do with note flight that I think it's wonderful. Uh, one of the assignments I had my kids do last year is I had them write their own final exam. I, the, I had them sit and think about their final exam, uh, think about the notes they learned, the rhythms they learned, and just write, the sixth graders had to write a 16 measure piece, the seventh, eighth graders wrote a 32 measure piece, and then they played it for me. And so they were able to sit and work on composition, and we could talk a little bit about one and five and start on this note, halfway through, you should be on this note, but make sure, you, and they were just able to, they wrote some really good things, and I was really excited about it. Um, but it's quick, it's easy to learn, um, like I say, I, when I first got it, I was scared to death that my little sixth graders wouldn't get it figured out. I mean, they have a hard time opening the case right. You know, clarinet parts going all over the floor. Um, but within 10 minutes, they got it. And uh, I, I've, get, I've gotten all kinds of questions during the shutdown. I've never gotten one that said, hey, can you remind me how to do the transposition in no flight? They just kind of, they get it. So we got to give our kids a little bit more credit. But no flight is a great tool. Uh, that I think is uh, really, it's, it's something else that we should have. And if you're looking for ways to get your administrators on board with technology, <clears throat> excuse me, tell them, no flight, $2 a kid, come up with the money. You want me to integrate technology? Great. Let's do this. Um, but no, um, that's it. I'm hoping I didn't go too quick on that, but that's, uh, that's no flight. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. There, uh, I 
as if there are some questions, I might I might take the opportunity to drop some links into the chat. But I also might. Um, what's nice is that Jamboard, um, Jamboard will continue to exist, right? And so uh, what I think I might do, or Stephen might, we'll put some links into Note Flight Learn, the the instrument libraries, um, and and so and so, and that we also encourage you. Um, leave leave some questions. Um, we we certainly have a couple minutes now. If if anyone would like to uh, tap a question into the uh, chat box, or we can you know unmute your mic and we can and talk a little bit. Uh, I don't have access to the Jamboard because I'm struggling to make sure I have enough internet right now with all my tabs that are open. So if you see something, uh, Chad, please bring it up if we have any questions that need to be asked or answered. Yeah. Um, yeah, and definitely put put ideas in there. Like I said, you know your classroom, so if you think something that might work, put it in there because maybe somebody else can can learn from that as well. And someone else can learn from that as well. Absolutely. Uh, well, if uh, there's not any questions today, I know we're at four o'clock and it's getting close to five o'clock. So perhaps these beverages will. Now oh, you can see it. These beverages will switch over to something. Uh, different. <laughs> so I just want to thank everyone for being here today. I um, also want to acknowledge that we have the uh, we have the uh, Northern Coast President Holly McDonald with us. Um, Emma Jolene, uh, you're Emma, you're President too, correct? Vice President, thank you. <laughs> uh, Vice <laughs> Emma Jolene, Emma, I there will never be another better introduction person than you. I. <laughs> I, I, if you want to know what I mean, folks, just go back and look at our webinars. Uh, the very first one we did, Emma was uh, our moderator, and I, that's just the idea that I have uh, in my in my head for moderating. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. All right, um, Stephen and Teresa are are always available on Twitter. Uh, please go find them, friend them, follow them, learn from them um, as I do. Uh, thanks for thanks for being here today. We also want to go, also want to give another round of applause for our exec administrator, Trish Adams, who uh, is behind the scenes, Just doing it all, Just doing it all, so that we have these opportunities. So um, thanks so thanks so much, everyone. Please join us next week. Um, we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>